faith works. This is the message of James, that we in our own ability cannot stand in the face of adversity. We could never find the strength to trust without faith because we don't have the capability to see above the trials that we meet, to keep our eyes focused on the King while counting the situation we are currently experiencing as joy. Faith works. This is the essence of James. We don't work to be saved. We work because we are saved. Without faith, without works, we too quickly become that man in the mirror staring at his face, but then forgets the way he looks as soon as he turns away. But with faith, with works, we stay steadfast on this journey, progressively sanctified, knowing we'll be perfected once we reach the other side. Faith works. This is the cry of James, that faith apart from works can never be sustained, that in every day and in every way we should see this truth proclaimed because it's faith that makes us doers of the word, not just hearers. It's faith that keeps us humble, not proud. It's faith that directs our tongues to bless, not to curse. It's faith that causes us to show mercy, not judgment. It's faith that leads us to true religion, not its empty substitute. And it's faith that's causing us to preach the good news to every tribe, tongue, and nation with every breath that we breathe. And it will be faith that causes us to worship our God for all eternity. This is the message of James. Faith works. Amen to that. Welcome to Impact Church this morning. How's everybody doing? Good. All right. Nice, brisk, cold February morning. Hopefully getting ready for spring here soon. It better warm up some. We got an egg hunt and all that candy is going to be hard as a rock frozen in them eggs if it's not. So, man, the first year we did this, it actually snowed. I ain't kidding, y'all. It snowed and we moved it inside of Thomas Jefferson Elementary School. Um, did the egg hunt outside, did all the events inside. So we'll make a way again somehow, whatever the Lord uh, pans out. So welcome here to church this morning. If you are visiting with us here at Impact, and this is your first time, maybe it's your uh, fifth time, whatever it is, and you're still searching for a church home, a place to anchor yourself, your family, a place to get plugged in, to belong, we hope the Lord would anchor you right here. This is your last stop and your last shop, and the Lord would uh, just settle you here and be a part of what He is doing through this church, using your gifts, your talents, your abilities. Um, to join this church body, but then also to grow in his word. That's what it's about, to come here hungry each and every week and, and to hear from God's word and to grow your faith, to be made into a disciple, an authentic follower of Jesus. If you're looking for a place like that, you're in the right place. If you're looking for a church that preaches the word of God unapologetically and doesn't sugarcoat it or water it down, welcome to Impact. You're right here. And this message it's going to be just that, because what you're going to hear, as you've heard probably the past two weeks, if you've been here, is a message that is not popularly preached in the American church today. Matter of fact, this is a, a lost gospel of the word that you're going to hear today that needs to be preached authentically and emphatically and unapologetically. Can I just say that? Because if we believe that we are closer to the, the end times, then we know that the Bible gives a very clear picture of what end time uh, f claimed followers of Christ will look like. And Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, there's coming a time where people will not tolerate sound doctrine. They're not going to hear this stuff preached like it should be preached. And instead, they're going to leave, get up in the middle of service. They're going to leave after service, never come back. And they're going to run to a teacher that tickles their ears. Well, brother, if he said it's coming, guess where we're at? <laughs> because we've seen just that. And again, you feel like, a, and you've, we've been through the book of Revelation, and we learned the delay of the sea in church age is the last church age before the rapture, before Jesus returns. And what was it about delay of the sea in church that Jesus had a problem with? Their lukewarmness, their worldliness, their desire to live like the world, but yet somehow try to claim the name of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to that church age. So this word is necessary. It needs to be preached. And that's why I believe the enemy has canceled it out of the mouth of so many pastors around the world today. But we're not going to shy away from it because what we're going to look at today is life giving. Can I just tell you that? 
It's life-giving and life-changing. And it is something that we should desire. And we're going to see that because we talked about this book of James is giving essentially a group of spiritual tests, if you will, to see if you are, are, are authentic in your faith. And we know that it's not a test of perfection, it's a test of direction. And we need to understand that. God's word is never a test of perfection, but it is a test of direction. Is God changing, molding, shaping you closer and closer into the image of his son? Or are you drifting and looking more and more like the world each and every day? So we have this message right in front of us today is in the end of James chapter one. And I want us to get this picture again. James, the um, half brother of Jesus, is writing this book. And this is written as the first words to the early church. This is the first words written before Paul, before Peter, before anything was penned and put on scroll to the church, this was it. So the very first words to the church was on authentic faith and what it looks like to live out the Christian life. So, We have this message today at the end of chapter one because chapter one's been deep. And this is our sixth week, by the way, in chapter one. Probably won't take as much time in any of the other chapters, but this one has so much to dig out. And today's message title is Mirror Image. Mirror Image. If you asked any of you in here if you know what you look like, you would say yes. Why? Because so many times through your life, you've looked in a what? (laughs) Looked in a mirror. You've seen yourself as you've grown from the time you were a, a child to your teenage years to your young adult years, and you've seen yourself grow or age or lose your hair and all that fun stuff. So you know what you look like. And you know what you have looked like in every season of your life because of a mirror. Many of us, uh, most of us, maybe all of us, you looked in a mirror today before you came here. Why? Why did you do that? Because you wanted to fix maybe what you thought was wrong when you got out of bed this morning. (laughs) You wanted to, to fix the hair that was messed up. I ain't have that problem. You wanted to fix your makeup and make it perfect because you desire to be different than what you started this morning. Guys, that is the picture that God wants us to get of this. This is our mirror, and it shows us who we are. It gives us a picture of who we are. And with Christ in us and this new spiritual desire, when we look in this, it then changes our attitude and our desire to want to make ourselves look different, to fix what's wrong in us because we don't want to look how we started. Let me pray for us before we dive in. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, please. Speak through your word today. Lord, we're here to honor you, to glorify you, to magnify you. Lord, to lift you up, to make much of you and your word. Lord, I know your promise is it never returns void. So Lord, I pray that you would go before us today, right now. Lord, open and prepare the hearts and minds of every person in here and every person at the sound of my voice online or anywhere, and any time they may listen. And Lord, let them only hear you. Lord, I don't want to be heard. I don't want to be seen. Lord, I want them to hear you. Lord, because I know your word changes lives. And Lord, that's why I'm not going to be ashamed to preach your word. Father, I pray that you would give us a hunger and a desire for this today. This would meet us right where we're at, that we needed this. Whether this encourages us, whether this strengthens us, whether this even steps on our toes and gives us like a healthy, convicting message from the Holy Spirit, whatever this word does in our hearts today, Lord, may you water the seed 
Lord, and grow and produce fruit out of your word and out of this message and through your spirit, Lord. Authentically change us. Lord, we desire to look more like Jesus. It only happens through your word and through your spirit because you get all the glory. It's not about us. It's all about you. You receive the praise for everything that you're about to do in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we turn to the book of James, if you're not there already, in chapter 1. And we're going to read this passage here at the end of James chapter 1 that really ties and wraps up everything that we've discussed so far. So I want you to see that connection. This is not a standalone message. This is a continuation of the previous weeks, and especially the, pre- the last two weeks where we had looked specifically about overcoming temptation and what that looks like. And then also how we are to receive the word. And last week's message, I believe, probably opened some eyes. I bet you learned something last week. And if you didn't, man, you know, I'm, man, Lord bless you. I did as I studied because I was prepared to teach last week's message at a whole different angle as many pastors would. And the Lord taught me something. Be like, uh-uh, this is, when you go back to the Greek and you look at the context, this is what it actually means. And it was like, whoa. If you didn't miss, if you missed that message, you didn't hear it. You need to go back. And listen to God's word because it ties us in with today. So what we're going to read here is a continuation from last week. So let's pick up in James chapter 1, verse 22, and read through the end of the chapter in verse 27. The word of God says this. Let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word. We've been doing, I almost forgot that again, man. We're going to do that. Get a good time to stretch your legs. And let's read God's word. It says, but be doers of the word. Somebody say doers. And not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. You may be seated. And just by reading that passage right there, you might be like, Brad, I ain't heard that type of message in the past 10 years in a church. Why? Can I ask why? Let me tell you why. Because this passage is all about obedience. And when you start preaching obedience in the church today, what do people start thinking? Legalist. That's legalism. Absolutely not. Because if obedience is legalism, may I propose that Jesus was the first legalist? What did he say in the Great Commission, guys? Go out, make disciples. What? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Did it stop there? No, he said, in teaching them to what? Obey. Obey what? All that I've commanded you. Obedience. It's the proof of authentic faith. And we're going to look at that. And we're going to make this clear because this needs to probably be a disclaimer at the beginning of a message like this. We are never, have not, are not now, and will never say that you have to do works to be saved. That is a lie. That is legalism. Because we are not, you heard it in the video to start, we don't do good works to be saved, but if you are authentically saved, you will do good works because you are saved. That is biblical truth, okay? And that's what we're going to look at. We are saved by faith alone in Jesus and the finished work on the cross. But when the Spirit of the Lord enters you, when you surrender and say yes to Jesus and no to self, God radically changes you from the inside out. 
and gives you a desire, Ezekiel 36 says, to follow his ways, to follow his words, his laws. That's authentic faith. That's why the New Testament says his words aren't cumbersome, that they're not burdensome. Guys, they are burdensome if your heart's not right. These words are very cumbersome and burdensome to a lot of people, even inside the church of 21st century America. They're very burdensome. Why? Because their heart's not right. If your heart's right, this stuff's sweet like honey, baby. This stuff is good. This stuff you long for, you hunger for, because it gives you life. And it teaches you more about your Lord, your Savior, about this new life, this, this race to walk in newness of life that you have in him now. And that should get you excited and you should want more of that, not run from it. Those that run from it or don't want to do it and only want to hear it, James is going to say, man, that's useless. That's not authentic faith. So let's look at this. In verse 22, right off the bat, doers of the word, be doers. You don't get any more straight than that. Be doers and not hearers only. Because what? What happens if you do that? Deceive yourselves. Guys, we know we live in a society and in a church age where there's a whole lot of people going to church this morning. There's a whole lot more people that aren't. But there's a whole lot of people that are. And even inside those churches, there's a lot of folks whose heart's not right. And they're not doers of the word because God hasn't radically changed their heart and life. Jesus gave so many parables about that. So if we take comfort in the fact merely that you hear God's word and then you're not doing it or you don't intend to do it, James says you're deceiving yourself. There's a lot of people today that want to go to church and just hear a good word. Just give me a good word, pastor. Put up some fancy props on the stage. Give me five good points that all start with the same letter. Just like a catchy phrase, maybe a little acronym. Give me some cool stuff. Where everybody, when you say something cool, somebody says, oh, wow. You heard that? Wow. Wow what? Wow because what you heard? Or wow because it's going to penetrate your heart? There's a difference. So many people seek a message just to be taught something, but they'd never want to be rebuked, corrected, or trained in righteousness. You see, if you're a Christian, the word Christian means a Christ follower. And back even in this time, if there was a teacher and somebody who wanted to be his disciple, they were one that not only just followed them around, but they wanted to learn from them to be like them. Do you see that? I don't just want to learn something cool. I want to be different. I want to be changed. If we see in Romans chapter 2, verse 13, where Paul said, For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. And some people thought that what Paul and what James taught was totally opposite. <laughs> Boy, I just heard what James just said right there. How about you? And again, we know that Paul was preaching justification by faith. But then as a proof of that justification, there was an a act of sanctification through the same grace that justifies, sanctifies, and changes you from the inside out. It's by grace that you're sanctified too. Did you know that? It's by the grace of God that he wants to radically change you and me even our heart to give us a new desire, to pull away that desire of the flesh that he just talked about earlier that will lead us into traps and to bite the baited hooks. He wants to give us a new desire, a new way. So what passage can you think of in the Sermon on the Mount does this almost directly point to? So we talked about so many times James, because the half-brother of Jesus, would, was taught by Jesus, and he would go back, and, and this whole book is almost a mirror reflection of what Jesus taught himself in the Sermon on the Mount. How about Matthew 7, 24 through 27? The home-building seminar, I call it, that Jesus gave. 
Let's read that passage together. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. Jesus' words, he said this, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, boy, that sounds familiar to what we just read, doesn't it? I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them mm, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. You see, this just isn't words out of the mouth of James, some kooky guy who spoke opposite of what the rest of the Bible says. This is a man who spoke directly the teachings of Jesus. This is all Holy Spirit, divine, given scripture. It's the word of God. It's not the word of James. It's the word of God. And it's very clear that there's a difference between somebody who hears the word and doesn't do it, and there's a clear distinction between somebody who hears the word and puts it into practice. And the difference is authentic salvation through the Spirit of God that radically changes a man or a woman in their life. The problem we face today is that so many aren't taught this. They're not taught this passage. They're not taught what it looks like to really follow Jesus. As such, we shared this statistic a few weeks ago, and we've been going through it in that Truth Project class, our biblical worldview class. Did you know, guys, that today a Barna poll study was taken and that inside the church, now this is inside the church, people who claim to be Christians, only 9% of people inside the church claim to have a biblical worldview. What does that mean? That means that they believe this Bible should affect everything that they do in life. This Bible has an answer for everything in life and affects everything, every choice that they should make. It should affect the way I talk. It should affect the way I I deal with my wife. It should affect the way that I deal with my kids. It should affect the way that, that, that that I walk in society that I live my life out. It should affect the things I listen to. It should affect the things I watch. That's a biblical worldview. Only 9% of people in the church today who claim to be a Christian have that. And you might say, well, where does, where's the failure at? Can I tell you it starts in the pulpit? Because pastors haven't been preaching. You know that same group, the Barna, they did a study and they polled pastors and they asked pastors, do you believe that the Bible has something to say about every aspect of our life and everything we face in life? Praise God, 90% of them said they they at least believe that. Somehow there were 10% call themselves pastors that don't believe the Bible's true. But at least 90% said, yeah, I believe that there's truth in there that has something to say about everything. But again, they get this. So then they polled the same pastor and said, okay, since you believe it has something to say, have you or will you preach what the Bible says regarding these things of life to confront your congregation with the truth? Less than 10% said they have or even would consider doing it because they were worried people would not like them or their church and leave. Less than 10% of pastors preach it. Less than 10% of people in the church have a worldview, Christian biblical worldview. Does anybody see a correlation besides me? Guys, it's got to be preached. But so many just want their ears tickled. I want this sentimental admiration or I want this emotional feeling I want this mental retreat in in the sermons I I don't want to be authentically changed by Jesus in his word I just want to feel good without being good 
It's the attitude of so many in the church. And James says that's not faith at all. What's scary is Jesus, before this home-building seminar we just read in Matthew 7, 21 through 24 through 27, also has a word that you're somewhat familiar with, what I consider to be some of the most scariest words in the Bible. It's Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23, just before it. And you know this, where Jesus said this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does, somebody said does, he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many wonders in your name? And I will then declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Guys, that's scary. Because what you're talking about is people who thought Not only were they saved, they thought they were doing ministry in Jesus' name. They thought they were saved. Get this. They had prayed a prayer. They probably had a date written down in their Bible somewhere. They had been baptized. They had been ordained in the ministry. But they weren't saved. Why? their heart they didn't let it penetrate their heart their heart was for something else they were acting out the things of this world and the practice of lawlessness jesus said and it was proof that that your heart wasn't radically changed by me guys that's scary stuff church membership doesn't save you Coming to church doesn't save you. Hearing a good word and being excited about it doesn't save you. Being baptized doesn't save you. You can go in a dry, unrepentant sinner and come up a wet, unrepentant sinner. What saves you? What changes you? The Spirit of Jesus being allowed by you to penetrate your heart and life and soul to the core by saying, God, I surrender. It's a heart of repentance. Guys, that's a lost teaching art in salvation today. Let me get this clear. You don't have to do the acts of repentance first to be saved. That would be a works-based faith that I've got to prove myself justified in the eyes of God somehow. That is not it. But a mind of repentance, yes, where I have a, a, repentance is a change of mind, guys. Where I say, I have a change of mind about who I am, about what's right and what's wrong, about what's word, and about who needs to be Lord of my life. And I just, in my mind, I repent. That means I turn away from myself, from things of this world, and Lord, I just turn toward you. Repentance is a turning to God. That's it. You know what happens when that authentically happens in your mind and in your heart? Then Jesus does a radical transformation work and starts transforming your life. And through his spirit and through his word, you will start to see the acts of repentance be walked out. Does that make sense? That's where we say repentance is necessary for salvation. Repentant acts before salvation? No. Repentance acts after salvation? Yes. Absolutely but a repentant mind at salvation where, God, I changed my mind about you, about your word, about who you are, about who's Lord of my life, and I'm turning to you, God. Yes. It's an about face, baby. It's a not keep living my life the way I want what I want to do and just drag Jesus along with me. That is not salvation. And that's what James is saying. So we see this direct distinction taught by Jesus taught by James here let's look at verse 23 this is where we're going to dig this stuff out this stuff's going to come alive again guys this is good stuff like last week y'all remember last week we hit that Greek word y'all remember that and it pointed to what that filthiness it pointed to what earwax you know what I'm saying there's a lot of people in here y'all ain't never going to remember y'all ain't never going to forget that you know what I'm saying and if you do your kids won't you know what I'm saying your kids like I got that now get the earwax out that was nasty We're going to learn something again here today, maybe not quite as nasty, but it's going to give a vivid picture to say and make it come alive. 
So if you look at verse 23 in James chapter 1, after he says, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves, it says, for if anyone's a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. If we look at this Greek word here, translated observes, that we see in verse 23, if he's a man that observes his natural face in a mirror. This word, this Greek word for observing gives the idea, the picture of a careful scrutiny. So by application here, James is, has even in mind people who give a careful scrutiny to God's word. They're the ones who maybe even study God's word. They may even um, find themselves in the ministry, as we just alluded to in, in chapter 7 of Jesus, what he said. It can even be people who come to church and just want to check off the box. And I want, to, I want to look at God's word. I want to give a little attention to it, but then I just want to move on. And I don't want to do anything else with it. I just want to check the box off that I went to church this week. Make myself feel better. The word here points to a scrutiny, but a scrutiny that's not taken seriously. So it can even point to some of the most wise biblical experts. This glass of the word, this looking into the word as a mirror, is not an ordinary looking glass, not an ordinary mirror, if you will. Because we know that you've heard it said that mirrors don't lie, right? Well, it's true. You know, it is what it is, and the mirror is what it is in reality. But you know what? The, that a mirror doesn't tell the whole truth. Because a mirror doesn't tell you what? What's inside you. <laughs> Guys, did you know that this Bible not only tells you what you look like on the outside and points to your actions, this Bible, this mirror will tell you what's on the inside. This one doesn't lie. This one doesn't even give a partial truth. This one gives you the whole truth. But I think there was a movie that said, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> Can you? That's the beautifulness of the Spirit of God in you because you want to hear this. And I want to be different. I want to be changed from the inside out. So when you look at this word here for look at his natural self the greek word for natural is that word genesis and we know that's for the beginning so it gives this face of a of birth it gives the face of the human nature of man it lets you see not just the outside actions because it's not the bible is not it's just a bunch of do's and don'ts please don't get that that's not what it is it's not about a bunch of actions it's about a heart James just pointed to that. It's about the desires that spring forth and grab and take the bait and, and manifest itself in all different kinds of actions. But it starts with the heart and the desire, okay? So we see this picture given right here that this mirror not only shows the actions that need to be corrected, but it shows the heart that needs to be changed and corrected, all right? It even shows motives, desires, the very inward condition of man. Somebody say, boom, <laughs> like that's it right there. Like it's not just about do's and don'ts. It's about my heart, Lord Jesus. What's in me that needs to be just pulled out of me and just radically transformed into your likeness? Lord Jesus, I desire that. I want that. I hunger for that. If you don't have that today, I want to offer you that today through Jesus. And he wants to radically change you. He doesn't want you to just come to church and learn the Bible. He wants you to really authentically be changed by him. He loves you and he laid down his life for you. Man, verse 24 says the one who doesn't and goes away does forget what they look like. So if you look into God's word, man, don't forget what you see. <laughs> Write it down, etch it onto your heart. Let it radically change you and mold you and shape you. Your prayer should be, Lord, help me play this out. Lord, I don't, I don't have what it takes to do this. And you're right. It's only through his spirit. That's the engine that will drive. We're going to read Psalm 119 a little later, but I just want to point out verse 9 real quick in this passage. It says, how can a young man cleanse his way? 
by taking heed according to your word. How can a young man cleanse his way? If you look at that Hebrew word there for way in the Old Testament, it's the word for a rut. How can I get out of the rut that life's put me in, that my, my sinful nature and my desires have put me in? How can I get out of that rut? By taking heed to God's word. This changes lives. So James points out two different kinds of people. There's one who just observes, looks maybe intently, but doesn't take it seriously. It's a glancing. It's a running past the mirror kind of deal in the morning. We've all been guilty of that at times, even with God's word. And I I fear so many times our devotions are done in that way. I don't authentically want to just sit down and, and I want to let God's word penetrate my life. I want a quick, I want a quick devotion da, 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 so I get out my door and check the box and say I did it. That's this observing word where I hear something, but I don't intently look at it to the point of wanting it to change me. All right? So verse 25, I think we've beat down 22 through 24. Verse 25, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. What's the perfect law of liberty? It's God's word. It's a synonym for God's word. Isn't that a beautiful description? The perfect law of liberty. Boy, that's God's word written for our transformed hearts by the spirit of God. He wants to set us free. Mm. So continue on. You look into this perfect law of liberty, and then it says, and continues in it. Circle that word continues. This isn't just a one-time snapshot. I did it one time. I'm good. I did it one time back in 1993 on such and such a date. Now I'm done. (laughs) Continues in it. Continues in it. This is not just an emotional experience as an altar. This is a life-forming, transforming relationship with Jesus. Tears don't save you either. Jesus does. So let's look at this word. He who looks, looks. Well, that sounds the same if I just read it from the outside, but I want you to see that the Greek word changes here. The Greek word changes into a word that means to peer into, to scrutinize, to look intently. This is a penetrating examination. And here's what I want to be highlighted. This is where this Greek word changes. This Greek word changes your posture of the way you look. This Greek word now means when I, when I look continuously into the word of God, this Greek word says this. You can look this up later if you want. It means I bend over to look more closely. I want to get, hold up. I want to see this. I'm not just passing by looking. I'm not just going to church like, come on, pastor, hurry up. I got to get out of here. I I actually saw sometime on social media a while back, somebody who put a post out that was looking for a church. And and their number one thing is I want a church service that doesn't last any longer than one hour. I kid you not. I almost chimed in, but I did. I'm like... But somebody did for me (laughs) very graciously and said, may I propose non-judgmentally and ask you why that you would only want an hour long church service when the rest of the week you have nothing but the world? Why do you want to limit God and his time? And maybe just maybe a church service that lasts longer. And they said this will go deeper in the word of God and radically change your life. Oh, it's like, thank you for saying that. Because it probably wouldn't have come well if I did. (laughs) Guys, that's it. This word is looks continuously. I don't want to just glance over this. I'm not just checking the box for church. I want to come in. I want to stay a bit. I want to look at this. I'm hungry for this. I, I I want to feast on this. You see the difference? That's the difference this Greek words are pointing to here. 
And that's where James says authentic faith is the one who wants to change the posture and how they look at God's word. And I think back to, to our message last week, our fifth point says receive the word with meekness. That word meekness is a change of heart posture and even receiving God's word. It's not just the posture of your physical self. Okay, I'm going to sit down for a while. It's the posture of your heart that really wants to bend over and absorb this and take all this in. Boy, that gives you another picture, I bet, of what this word just said. It's not the same. It's not the same. Absorb God's word as a mirror that we desire to see what's wrong and make it right. And guys, that's the point. When God points something out, take heed to it. If God points something out through his word, man, don't, I hope you don't ever leave and, and try to justify afterwards why you don't need to repent and why repentance toward that's not necessary in your life because so-and-so doesn't, because everybody else is doing it, or you don't know the situation I'm in and my job's going wrong and my kids and my health and my this. And, and, and guys, that's the enemy wanting you to, to, to cancel out the word of God and just be hearing it and not doing it. That's exactly what that is because he's good at that. He wants to pluck that seed, man. He don't want that seed to take and make a fruit. He wants to get it out of you. He wants you to ignore it, excuse it. And if you do so, you're deceived. That's what James said in 22. And get this, if you're taking notes, you want to write down this statistic. 100% of deceived people don't think they're deceived. 100% of deceived people don't think they're deceived. So what breaks them? Only this, only this in the spirit of God. That's it. Not me, not you, not mom, not dad, not coach, not teacher, not pastor. Jesus and his word. And if you don't let the word of God penetrate you through his spirit, and you keep bowing up to that, you will continuously be deceived the rest of your life until you let the Lord change you. Continues in it. This Greek word has an intense meaning here. Again, I know, and we're not going to like say a raise of hands, but how many of you ladies spend at least like 30 minutes in the mirror every day? You know, don't raise your hand, you know what I'm saying? But I, I know some of y'all be like, yeah, it's me. Some of y'all be like, 30 minutes, man, that's half time, baby. I got to take a break. I'm going back for another 30. I don't know. But this Greek word gives this picture of a lady that's intently looking in this mirror and getting everything right. Getting, I mean, just everything perfect. Every, bill, every piece of hair in the right spot, all that. That's this Greek word. I continuously desire and look and want to get it right. Boy, that changes the meaning, doesn't it? That's what it's talking about. And guys, that's where it's so, so, so important that we understand if the word of God has this much power, back to what we talked about at the beginning, that the preacher is responsible for being very intentional to not hinder its power. I'm going to say it again. The pastor, a true pastor, needs to be very intentional about making sure this word goes out fully and completely without holes in it, preaching the full counsel of God's word so it can do exactly what it's supposed to do. Yes, you won't be popular in this age for preaching it. We're in the Laodicean church age. We're in the church age that Paul told Timothy. People are going to run from it and go to people to tickle their ears. Guess what? If you preach the word of God authentically, then what should be happening? Should be a lot of people that don't want to hear it. That's just truth, right? But the pastor needs to be very careful that he presents it the right way. Let me read this quote from Charles Spurgeon. And you know, that those of you that have been at Impact for a while, you know, and you've probably seen that that's my heart's desire. And it even hurts me at some times when people leave because they don't like what they heard. But it's still the calling that I know God's put on my life. That I would rather honor God than honor man. I would rather have the applause of God than the applause of man. 
but it's still hard because I'm not wired that way. Because I want everybody to like me. I want everybody to like this church. But I know if I preach the word like it's supposed to be, that's not going to be the case. I want you to hear this from Spurgeon, and I hope prayerfully that you would give me an A plus on this. This is his quote. Certain preachers dream that it is their business to paint pretty pictures, but it is not so. We are not to design and sketch, but simply to give the reflection of truth. We are to hold up the mirror to man's nature in a moral and spiritual sense and let them see themselves therein. We have not even to make the mirror, but only to hold it up. The thoughts of God are not our own thoughts. And not our own thoughts, sorry. The thoughts of God and not our own thoughts are to be set before our hearers' minds. And these discover a man to himself. The word of the Lord is a revealer of secrets. It shows a man his life, his thoughts, his heart, his inmost self. Don't have to paint a pretty picture. All I have to do is preach this word. God wrote a book. Why would I be ashamed of it? Why would any pastor be ashamed of it? But so many are, less than 10% are not ashamed. More than 90% are ashamed to preach it fully. They'll preach out of the Bible, but they're not preaching the whole Bible because they don't want to. That, my friends, is a reflection of their heart. Choose this day who you serve, God or man. What you going to do? It's a hard calling. And I hope you see Christ in that here. So what is this mirror image as we come down the line here to close this up that we're looking for? I'm not going to read the passage. You can go back and read it later now for the sake of time. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And it's basically saying that we are to be transformed to the image of Christ. And and, and it's from glory to glory. That it's from start to finish. From first glory of salvation until ending glory. That there's a continuous process of sanctification, of being changed into the image of Christ that takes place in an authentic believer's life. Why? What is the purpose of that? Why does God want to do that? So you and I can shine the light of Christ into a dark world that desperately needs it. That's why. It's not just for you. It's for others. It's for God's glory. It's called your testimony, guys. Can I tell you, your testimony is not just your past, what God brought you out of. That's part of it. Did you know your testimony is also your present, what you're doing with Jesus and the Word of God now? Did you know your testimony is also your future decisions, what you're doing with Jesus and the word of God today, tomorrow, next week, next month. Our actions are our testimony of Jesus. That's why it's so important to bring glory to God and to shine the light. That we're not to be put under a, a lamp, under a bowl. We're to be set up on its stand to give light into all the house. So let your light shine before others so they'll see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Boom. That's it. So what happens? When you receive Jesus, the Holy Spirit's now inside of you. What does that mean? Guys, that means you've got a new DNA. Everybody knows what DNA is in this world. Now, even if you're not a scientist, right? Even if you're not a biologist, you know what DNA is. You've watched enough like uh, TV shows and all that kind of stuff. What is DNA? It identifies you, right? And your DNA gives you the very characteristics of everything you are. So get this. When you or I get saved, we now have the DNA of Jesus. So every single one of us that are in Christ now have his DNA in us. So therefore, there should be characteristics of him that start coming out in all of us. Make no mistake, no if, ands, or buts about that. It's a changed life. Slowly, gradually at some times, absolutely. But continuously, yes. Test of perfection, no. Test of direction, absolutely. Have you been set on a new direction? Is your heart desire differently? You may trip, you may fail. But is your heart desire to make excuses for that and stay in that or to get up out of that rut through his word and be different? 
It's a desire change. Flips. That's what a Christian is, a Christ follower. Desire to be more like their teacher, Jesus. It's like the images you see um, if you're old school like me and you see those what they call lenticular printing, those old school things. Before we had technology, we used to have fun with paper, right? And you used to have these images that were on this kind of like vinyl looking paper and you kind of shift it one way and it changes the movement or the shape or the image where there's two images in one. And we used to think that was really cool as a kid because we didn't have Xbox and, and cell phones back then, all right? Or you've seen these pictures that are dual images where you look at it and you can see one thing or another. But I like this analogy better. It's like mirror image photography is how we are to be with Jesus. You ever seen the, the beautiful tree and, and picturesque landscape and then it's set beside a, a pond or a lake that's dead still? And the exact reflection of that tree and that landscape is imposed upon that lake? Well, that lake doesn't have that image without that reality. Guys, there's one that's real and one that's a mirror image reflection. Guys, that's what we're to do with us, with Jesus. That's us with Jesus. And it's like we're the moon. He's the sun, the S-O-N and the S-U-N. The moon doesn't give off light by itself. The moon only reflects the light of the sun to earth. Come on, somebody. That's good. Y'all can write that down. That we're to be a reflection of the sun to this earth. That's what James is saying. It's authentic salvation. So what's the biggest test in this for us or even in pastoral ministry? Think about that. What's the biggest test of pastoral ministry? We just talked about that. Guys, the biggest test of, of ministry and, and what God's going to judge me on is not going to be that building or that land going up over there. It's not going to be the sports complex one day that exists if the Lord wills it. It's not going to be the size of our budget. Not going to be judged on our average attendance. It's not even going to be about how well organized our church is. It's going to be how committed I was to preaching the full word of God to present his word like a mirror so that people can see Jesus and then see themselves. That's it. To mishandle the word of God is to misrepresent the one who wrote it. To reject the word of God is to call the one who wrote it a liar and to make you Lord, not him. I want you to think about that. If I present truth, I bring God's word, and you should go home, and, and you should be a good Berean and be like, is this what really what the Lord's got? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't just take some because I say it. I promise you I'm going to study and make sure it is God's word, not mine. I promise you that. You can go study all you want. If you want to put 20 hours of study in like I do, you go right ahead, baby. But I'm studying every single week, and I promise you I'm not bringing somebody's opinion or my own opinion. But you should go and make sure that's word of God. And if that is the word of God, if that is the truth— and you reject that and run from it, then you have said God is a liar and that you're Lord of your life and not him. Because here's the truth. You become what you worship. If you worship money, you'll become greedy and materialistic. If you worship power, you'll become hard and cold and insensitive to others and inconsiderate. If you worship things and people of this world, you'll become worldly-minded and you'll cast off God's word. You can't serve both. And I'm not going to share all of what I intended to share, but I want to bring it up because we, did, we just watched the Super Bowl last Sunday and there were some things that happened in that Super Bowl that just kind of raised an eyebrow at. And I don't know if you are, are, are deep enough in the word or, or, or whether you've kind of caught all this stuff. Some of it I didn't catch during the, the game. Some of it I caught later on uh, broadcasts and stuff like that. But there was this time in the game where this uh, little girl that sat up in the box um, with Taylor Swift so uh, many games was wearing an upside down cross. I don't know if you noticed that or seen some of that this week. And at one point when the camera went to Taylor Swift after a 
touchdown for the Chiefs or whatever, and they started hitting their shots, drinking their alcohol. And she knew the camera was coming, and this chick did this. She held up, I'm not even going to do it, some double devil horns on her hands, raising them up, and then grabbed her chain of her upside-down cross and did this. And of course, this week, everybody comes out, oh, that cross didn't mean that. Y'all Christians, y'all are just, you know, too much. And, and that, ha- that wasn't given in that respect. That wasn't up, down, down cross. That was actually a snowflake and, and this, that, the other. And they said, and that wasn't double devil horns. That was something called a quiet coyote. It means to quiet down people who are speaking against you and this, that, and the other. Whatever. Little suspect when you raise them up and then do that. You know what I'm saying? I was born in the day, but it won't yesterday, baby. You know what I'm saying? All right. Anyway, that's on the mild side compared to some of this stuff. There was a commercial even. You've probably seen it before under the name that Jesus gets us. He gets us. And it had this very political stance on everything that pointed to political issues of tolerance on transgender and homosexuality and abortion and environment stuff and all this political stuff of tolerance. And then at the end said, Jesus gets us as if, as, and gives the impression as if all that's okay. We can just wash feet together, group hug, and we're all saved. And I don't have time to play it, but somebody redid a commercial, a pastor, about how it should have been. And be like, yeah, he gets us, but he doesn't just get us. He saves us. He redeems us. He changes us. That's what he does. And it has a picture. It says was a, a former uh, prostitute, a, a, a former jihadist, a, a former transgender person, a former this. And it gave all these pictures of people who were once this way, but Jesus radically changed them from the inside out. That's what it should have been. And then the other thing I think was the most obvious is, is I, and I don't know much about him. I haven't ever listened to him, but I know he's been around a long time, and that was Usher. And, and, I, and I saw a lot of Christians posting stuff about it, even a lead pastor that I uh, know, and, and he's talking about the Super Bowl halftime show in Usher. And I'm like, well, man, maybe I, maybe I missed something. I'm like, I, I watched the halftime show this year. I usually don't, but I was like, I didn't get that warm, fuzzy feeling. <laughs> It just seemed worldly to me. People taking off their shirts and rolling their hips and all. I mean, I was like, yeah. So I was like, man, maybe I missed something. And so I looked up Usher and, you know, on the outside, you know, it said that he was raised in a Christian home. And he, of course, he claims some type of faith. And it even said he posts scripture from time to time on social media. I'm like, hmm, okay, well, that's cool. And like, well, but then I got a reading and said that he's dove into, he's being confused a little bit with some kind of Hinduism, has a tattoo of an eyeball underneath his chin that cross represents the Holy Spirit, but then also Hinduism or something like that. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, well, let's cut to the chase. What's James talking about? What are you doing? What does he do? Produces music. If there's Christ likeness in him, it ought to come out in his music, Right? Right? All right, so uh, I, I gave the brother a chance. I know he's been, you know, maybe ra- God's radically changed his life now, so I didn't go back and look at music 20 years ago. He just came out with a new album Friday before the Super Bowl, last Friday, February 9th. It's called Coming Home. I said, let me just see what the lyrics of that song says. So I clicked on the title track to that album, Coming Home. Guys, I can't read the lyrics to you. I can't do it. It is absolute filth. Trash. Should a Christian identify themselves with being okay with that? Guys, I think so many times we've been desensitized and say, well, that's not as bad as this, and it's just okay. Or, or even say this, well, he posts scripture, Brad. Why can't I support him? Guys, Paul said in Corinthians that even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Isn't that what Satan wants to do? is present himself as an angel of light, but then behind the scenes represents something totally different. We can't be in support of that in any way, shape, or form. We've got to be radically changed, and we've got to do our homework as followers of Christ. We can't go out and publicly support something that represents worldliness. You definitely don't want your little girl's dancing to that music one day. I can promise you that. Go look up the lyrics to that word if you don't believe me. Coming home. Google it. I can't read it out here. We can't support that. 
He can post scripture all he wants. We need to pray for his heart because he needs to be radically changed. The Bible's a mirror, guys. It shows reflection of us. And here's the point. What does the Bible want to show us? What does God want to show us through his word about ourselves? He wants to show us who we are, the nature of who we are, but then he wants to show us who we ought to be by his grace. He wants to show us the nature of who we are, but the beautiful part is he wants to show us who we ought to be by his grace, that he wants to radically change us and move in us to be different. Verse 26 and 27 I end with the little pop quiz that James gives here. One of the pop quiz about what it looks like to be a doer of the word says it right there. What's the pop quiz? Control your tongue. Be others focused. That's going to the orphans and the widows. And I would say others focused and also non-materialistic because what do orphans and widows need? Resources financial assistance, time. I can't be greedy with my time and my money and spend time with others. I can't be greedy with everything that God's given me and spend time and reach out to others. The third one, and this is the, this is the blanket over everything. Don't let yourself be spotted up by the world. Don't be polluted by the world. I want to share this picture in closing of this little animal this animal called a North American ermine. And if you've been with uh, Impact for seven years from the start, you might say, Brad, this ain't the first time you've done this. No, it's not. It's the third, actually. And it probably won't be the last time because it's such a perfect picture of this. What does it mean to, be, to uh, not let myself be spotted up by the world? This ermine turns into a perfectly white coat fur white coat like you see here in the winter and get this this little animal refuses to get its fur dirty it won't do it so much so that people who hunt it and want its fur because uh, for hide and stuff because it's so um it's worth so much money that they know this and this is how they get the ermine they know it won't get itself dirty so they'll find its two holes usually has an entrance and an exit two ways in to its home so they'll run it out of one hole, but before they do, they'll cover the other hole with motor oil. So when this ermine comes out, they run it out of this hole and chase it with the dogs. They know the ermine is eventually going to try to get to the other hole to go back in. But when it gets to that hole, it sees this mess around its hole, and it will not go in there because it refuses to get its fur dirty. So it turns on its attacking dogs and it will fight to its death. I know that seems sad. But guys, how often are we willing to get our fur dirty just so we can feel safe? <laughs> just so we can feel comfort in the things of this world. When God is calling us to be unspotted by this world, to be different, to come out from among them and be changed. Don't even support the unrighteous in what they do. You're to be in the world, but not of the world. We're to be different. We're to be radically changed by the blood of Jesus who poured his blood out on a cross, not so I can be like the world and support the world, but so that I can share the light of Jesus with the world, to be different. Don't be okay with being spotted by the world anymore. Resolve in your heart that we will be an unspotted generation, that we will be an unspotted church. Yes, we will mess up, but we will never make excuses for running in that hole and it doesn't matter if I get dirty because I'm going to feel safe. That we will turn and that we will fight for the authentic word of God. I'm going to tell you, God's looking for a few good men and a few good women who want to stand for his truth, who will stand in the gap that's been placed of human society for his truth and stand on it and preach the truth in love and watch God's word go to work and do what it does. And that's change your life, mine, and those around you. This is the mirror. Who are you? Better question? Who do you want to be? God wants to change you. Let's bow our head, close our eyes.
I wonder if there's anybody here, you might just say, Brad, I've never surrendered my heart to Jesus like that. I've never repented, did an about face and just turned to God and gave him everything. And I want to do that right now. I'm going to lead you through a prayer and I want you to do business with God from your heart to God's heart right now in this place. Or you might be here and you might say, Brad, I, I've walked in and out of church doors a lot. And man, there was a time I actually, I committed my life to Christ and, and I know I was saved. And I, the Lord just changed me and I was on fire for the Lord. And, but lately I've deviated, I've walked away. I've been spotted by the world. I'm like the prodigal son. I'm, I'm in this pig slop, man. And I, I want out. I don't want to be like this world no more. I want to be radically changed and different for his glory. And I want to be like Christ. So I want to rededicate my life to him today. I want to be infused and empowered by the spirit of the living God where his word radically transformed my life, radically transforms my marriage, radically transforms my children, radically transforms my community. I want to be a doer of the word of God. And I want to rededicate my life right here today. And I'm not ashamed. If that's you, I want you to do business with Jesus the same right now. To commit your life to him for the first time and to rededicate your life boldly and unashamed. To say, dear Jesus, Lord God, I admit to you that I've messed up. I'm a sinner. And I'm in need of you, my Savior. And Lord, I'm tired of running. Tired of doing life on my own. I give it all to you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die on that cross, to break his body, to shed his blood, to take the punishment that was due me and to place it upon himself so that I could be set free, that I could be forgiven, that I could be redeemed, restored, renewed, that I could be changed. And then, Lord, thank you for raising him from that grave. Three days later, like the prophet said he would do, like he told his disciples he would do, that he got up at that grave because he wasn't just a man, he was God in the flesh. And in doing so, he stands in victory over all hell, death, and the grave. And Lord, I want to identify, identify myself with Jesus, and I want to stand in victory with him. And my commitment to you is, Lord, that the rest of my life is yours. Every step I take, every breath I make, what I listen to, what I watch, what I support is all going to be under your authority of your word and your spirit. Lord, change me, mold me, shape me. I ain't playing games no more, God. I refuse to get my fur dirty. I'm not going in that hole anymore. And if I have to, I'll turn and fight. But I'm not getting dirty no more. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for changing me. Amen. If that's you in this place, and you did business with Jesus right here today for the first time, or you rededicated, renewed your calling with Jesus right now, you just boldly and unashamed raise your hand right now and say, Brad, I did business with Jesus. I'm not ashamed about that. All over this place, if I don't see you, God does. We're going to end our service like we do every single week. And I'm just going to ask you to do and make action with your feet to what God's doing in your heart. So let's stand to our feet. Let's sing with all our heart, with all our voice. And whatever that is, maybe you made a decision for Jesus just now. Maybe you just need a prayer with one of the pastors up here. You can do that prayer over a lost loved one, prayer over a situation going on in your, in your life with your finances, your relationships, your health, whatever it may be, prayer over a lost loved one. Maybe you just pray over joining the church, whatever it is. Let's come right now as the Lord leads. Thank you so much for joining us this week in worship at Impact. We trust to know that God's doing an amazing work in your life and in your heart through his word because he is faithful. Hey, if you made a decision for Christ here today, would you let us know? I'd encourage you to go to our website, www.impactforest.org. There you'll find out how you can contact us and let us know what God's doing in your life. 
There you'll also find out more about what God's doing through this church to impact lives and also find ways that you can give to financially support this ministry as the Lord leaves. We hope that you can join us here each and every week online if you cannot attend the service in person. And we would encourage you to lock arms with us in this mission that God has placed us on to make an impact for Christ. We'll see you next Sunday.